Hey, kiddos, it's Pop-Pop, and guess what time it is? It's story time with Pop-Pop. We got a really neat one here today. It's called The Mouse and the Song. Uh, this story started oh, was started by a very famous writer, Henry David Thoreau, who he was building a cabin, and he saw a mouse in his cabin, and he watched it, and he used his imagination to come up with this story. So y'all never forget to use your imagination because you can come up with stories too. This is the mouse. Mouse and the song, right? Okay. Let's get it ready here. Y'all ready? Get you in the middle here. There, can you see everything? Okay, good. There was a certain white-footed mouse who lived in the woods by a pond. And to her, life was a constant searching for the seeds and berries, bark, and insects that mice eat. But other hungry, hairy animals eat mice. So life was also running from the fox, the weasel, and the silent owl. They would all like to eat the mouse. Life was establishing a territory large enough to provide food and then defending it against other mice. Life was making a shelter to live out of the cold and wet. Life was scurrying through mazes of paths in the summer grasses to catch crickets and darting over snowfields in winter when there was not much cover. And also important... Life was finding a mate and raising young, for mice are the prey of many, and only their numbers save them. That is the way of mice. Once in summer, mouse claimed a territory in a clearing where a man was building a cabin. It seemed a likely place to live. Already, a phoebe had her rest in the woodshed and Robin and a robin family lived in a nearby pine. Rabbits and raccoons moved like shadows about the dooryard at evening and an occasional woodchuck would amble past through the scrub oak and the sumac. It just sounds beautiful. Wind blew through the trees from across the nearby pond bringing the scents and the sounds of passing animals. And there was sometimes a strange sound also, a clear singing such as no bird made. But it was not a threat. So Mouse built a snug nest of grass and wood shavings in the sandy cellar of the cabin. And there she bore her young. For two whole days, while the man went about his work outside and in the room above, Mouse tended her babies. She hummed a buzzing song, as white-footed mice sometimes do, and never left them, not even to eat or drink. By the third day, when they could be safely left alone for a while, Mouse went out to look for food. See, there's Mouse looking. Mouse now saw her first human being. He was sitting outside against the wall eating his noon lunch when she came from the cellar. Crumbs of bread and cheese had fallen at his feet. Since this new animal did not seem like a threat to Mouse, she dashed forward and snatched several crumbs in her mouth and ran back to the cellar. The man didn't do anything to stop her. So she went the next day for more crumbs and soon made a habit of joining him for lunch. Look, there she is down there. You see her little mouse? I think she's getting used to the man. One day, Mouse ran up the cabin wall and clung to the rough boards a moment to get a better look at the man. Then she jumped to his shoulder and ran down his sleeve to his hand. Ah, she sat there eating a piece of cheese from his fingers. 
His palms smelled of pine resin from the wood he had been handling that day. When she finished, Mouse hopped down, washed her face and paws, and calmly walked away. Wow, he didn't even train her. Soon they were making a game of lunch. The man would pretend to hide crumbs in his hand while Mouse ran along his arm, around and round, dodging and pouncing until he gave her the cheese. Ho, ho, ho. She always ate it neatly and wiped her face and paws like, like a fly before she left him. Mouse's life was still very busy, though. Her babies became more and more active as they grew. She had to nurse them and still find enough food to keep up her own strength. And when she went out after seeds and fruits, she had to be wary of the foxes that sometimes came around the clearing or of the hawks that fell out of the sky and pounced before the victims knew anything was going to happen. Look at her hiding down there. Soon, the man moved into his cabin full time. Other people came by to visit, though Mouse generally avoided them. Some would talk with the man by the hour, going on and on. Only chattering red squirrels could give them any competition. <laughs> or the whippoorwill that sat on the ridge pole every evening to repeat and repeat his whistling call. But when the man was alone, as he usually was, and not working on the cabin or in the garden or walking off somewhere, he spent his time in two ways. He would sit quietly outdoors, just looking and feeling, or he would write, turning his thoughts and feelings into words. And Mouse heard the strange singing more often now, but she did not know what caused it. One night, when Mouse crept back to her nest, she heard singing coming from the floor above. She paused to listen to it. It wasn't exactly like a bird. But what else could that could sound like that? Quickly, she scrambled up the wall and squeezed out of the room and out into the room of the cabin. The man was sitting in a rocking chair holding a long wooden tube. He blew across a hole near one end of it while working his fingers over the holes along the, its length to make sweet sounds. Look, the man has an audience, a mouse. <laughs> mouse held perfectly still listening and listening. She was lost in the music and, it f and filled with it as with breath so that she did not know when it had entered into her and she into it. A trill of high notes fell in that small room like bright rain, followed by a lower passage that ran like streams under the earth. The flute sang clustering sounds, bright as sun sparkles on moving water, and single notes that struck the air with the sharpness of winter stars. When the man had finished the song, he smiled to see the mouse watching him. But Mouse flicked back into the cellar and down to her nest, where she lay for a long while, as the man continued to play upstairs. Then she went outside to finish her night's work of foraging. On the next night, when the man played the flute, she went back. Night after night, she came to listen until the music became a part of her life, a part not concerned with running away or being hungry. Hearing the music was like eating a juicy bud after a winter of dry, withered hulls. Soon Mouse was sitting on the man's shoulder as he played to be near the vibrating 
flute. Look there, you see the mouse? The fox, the owl, the weasel, the hawk were still a part of Mouse's days and nights, but now she had the music as well, and it could not be taken from her. Mouse's babies, they grew up. They began finding food for themselves, and their fur changed from gray to an adult rust. They went off on their own. Now with only herself to care for, Mouse began gathering nuts and seeds for the winter. The man, too, prepared for colder weather by finishing the cabin. He had to shingle and plaster the walls, install a hearth, and lay a second floor over the single layer of rough boards then in place. But first he cleaned the cellar. Uh oh he cleaned the cellar. And when Mouse came home, the dust, the shavings, all of her hidden nest were swept away. Confused, she ran out of the cellar, dodging across the clearing from cover to cover, and streaked up a chestnut tree. From high in the branches, Mouse looked down and saw the man going into the cabin with a bucket of water. See him down there? Suddenly, some branches above her, a red squirrel began buzzing a warning. Mouse turned to look, and there, gliding down the branch, head low, eyes fixed upon her, was a mink. Uh-oh. With a squeak of alarm, Mouse scrabbled to the end of the branch and leapt, leapt for the nearest twig. The mink ran close behind as she dodged and twisted. They ran from tree to tree until Mouse slipped and fell, thrashing through twigs, grabbing at leaves. She caught her balance finally on a low-hanging limb, limb and spying a small hole in a rotten branch, she hid inside. Her fall startled a pair of blue jays who now saw the mink and flew up screeching at the intruder. The mink lost the mouse's scent, so he turned away and flowed away along the upper branches with the noisy birds following. Whew. Mouse stayed in the hole until the following evening, and when she came out, she had no idea where she was or where the clearing was. The clean scent of water blew from the nearby pond, and passing ducks called to each other high in the air. So Mouse made a new territory in the woods, small but good enough, and built a home in an abandoned, abandoned bird's nest in a scrub oak. She roofed it over with dry grass, lined it with chewed up bits of feather and moss. Mouse was more cautious than ever in her new life away from the cabin. She stored seeds and nuts against the winter in the crack of a nearby stump. She hid from predators and studied each warning breeze. Sometimes she thought she heard the flute again, very faint and distant but was never sure where the sound came from. Her life in the cabin seemed long ago and far away, hardly real anymore. She was almost never reminded of it. Oh. But there was one gray dawn when the hollow clamor of migrating geese came ringing from the sky. The north was dark with advancing snow clouds. Everything down to the last grass blade was edged with white frost. Ooh, that sounds cold. Mouse sat in the spiny tangle of a barberry bush eating one of its bright red fruits. When she finished, she wiped her paws and face and sat looking up at the sky. It was empty for the moment, 
except for the hurrying clouds. The breeze brought no dangerous sense. Then Mouse sang. She tipped back her head and sang in a high, clear trill, like the trilling of some small bird. This was not the insect buzzing she had sometimes hummed before, but a true song that rang like silver in the cold morning air. She clung to the thorns and sang from the center of her being. When she had done, she climbed down from the bush and returned to her nest as the first flakes of winter snow came drifting down. And that, my friends, is the story. The story of the mouse and the song. Gosh, I hope you liked that one. It was a little different. Okay, kiddos. We'll see you next time for Storytime with Pop-Pop. For now, this is Pop-Pop saying bye-bye.